Welcome to the Startup Grind. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming to our second Startup Grind. There's a lot of new faces, a lot of repeat faces, which is awesome. Um, we're going to do a couple of different things here. I think a very valuable thing for any entrepreneur is the ability to just get in front of people, uh, tell them about your idea, so you can get that constant feedback and take it to the next step. So with that, we have uh, three or two entrepreneurs that are going to come up, do a little presentation about uh, you know, what they do, um, their story, the elevator pitch, and we're going to start with Jess Lee, the founder of Handstand. My name is Jessica Hedgen Lee, and I'm a co founder of Handstack, where we make event organizing easier. So, we understand that nobody wants to waste time, especially on something that you work on that's close to your heart. We are a web and mobile app that helps volunteer based organizations coordinate tasks real time and promote events nearby uh, to people nearby with our geolocation tool and we our customers are volunteer based nonprofits universities businesses schools and we charge them for white label apps and and some monthly subscriptions we have currently 34 beta signups and we we expect to have $100,000 in revenue with just 50 customers in the first year. And we want to save, save time, save money, and have help them focus on their big vision. Thank you, and uh, talk to me later if you're interested, and email is jess at handstack.org. Thanks. Thanks, Jess. How's it going? My name is Nick Diatori, and I uh, just wanted to share with you guys real quick what I'm, what I'm looking to do. I'm in a real early, early startup phase, um, just kind of trying to spread the word about, I'm um, looking to do like a professional network management, context management, all, all professional context, so nothing like you know your, your iPhone context. Um, but really, everyone's experienced at some point in their professional career, semi-professional career, um, meeting a bunch of people, at, whether it might be at a, an organized networking event or just you know on the street one day, you get their business cards. Especially if you go to an organized event, you get a ton of business cards, and then you really fall out of touch almost immediately with those people. Or you send them a follow-up email, and then that's about it. So a lot of a lot of different opportunities can be brought to you just by networking more effectively, and that's what I'm looking to do. I know just from my own uh, my own experience that networking is hard work. And I don't want anyone to waste all that hard work that they've already done to get the context, establish the context, by then not following up with it. So I'm looking to get people who are interested to provide me with their context. So I'm a, and then I'll essentially organize it into a spreadsheet that I'll provide to you once weekly, an updated spreadsheet. So taking your Rolodex or your piles of business cards or the context in your Blackberry and putting it in um, an organized spreadsheet that you'll actually see every week. So you'll be reminded every week. And then the real hallmark of what I'm looking to do is um, provide you a notification to your email inbox um, on a time interval basis for each of your contacts of when you should reach out to them. And in each email notification, give you a template email to get you started. So that, you know, some people say, oh man, I gotta send all these emails now. I don't even know what to say. I don't really wanna think about it right now. So I'm looking to take off as much work as possible for you and make it and do essentially all the legwork except for actually contacting the people that you met yourself. I mean, I can't do that for you. So, um, so in each uh, in each email notification and template email that I would provide, I'd also provide some suggestions and tips and ideas about how to personalize it to each contact based on information you give me. Um, how to stand out, how to provide value, so it's a mutually beneficial relationship and not just a help me out kind of relationship. And um, that, that's, that's about it. That's 
what I'm looking to do. So if anyone's interested, you can find me after the event and I can give you a flyer or talk to you more about it. I'll be more than happy to talk to you. Thanks. Nick was a very good sport. I gave him uh, absolutely no notice that he was going to do this presentation. And he was very happy. Uh, uh, ben with Wheaties, who provided the food, and they also have an information booth uh, when you entered. He's going to talk a little bit about what he does with that organization. How's everybody doing? Um, so I'll, I'll be one person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. So, um, yes, so I'm the executive director of Weedy Buffalo. We're Westminster Economic Development in Initiative. Whoa. Um, and we work on the west side of Buffalo, which means west of Main Street. We also are the people, uh, it's just me, but you can come visit me over at the little table over there that everybody's intimidated to go over, except a few of you. Um, and we, that's our table, definitely stop by. What we do is we're a nonprofit that serves the community in these ways, in four different areas. One, after school program. We work with youth, helping them educate, particularly refugee students. We're the only organization in Western New York that does this and works with them um, throughout the school year at the very beginning. That's not really related to a lot of what you do. The rest is. So we, um, our organization does four, two other major things, which is business and finance. We help people start businesses. Um, on the West Side of Buffalo, if you've heard of the West Side Bazaar, has anybody heard of that? Yes, a few. Oh, good. Ooh, um, someone's marketing, not us. Uh, thank you, Buffalo News. Um, so it's very exciting that we have that program, but that's a small business incubator. Many people don't know that. It's actually a small business incubator focused on retail, food service, and service businesses. Um, we also provide training uh, pri previous to prior to starting your business and then after you started your business. And then we also do micro lending up to $15,000 to uh, start up businesses, expand your business, and also credit building loans. So those are the areas that we work in. Uh, we're located on the west side of Buffalo on Grant Street, uh, but we work anywhere west of Main Street. And uh, definitely if you haven't tried the food at the West Side Bazaar, stop by and also feel free to talk to me more afterwards. All right, thank you. So now we're going to uh, introduce our sponsors who very graciously donated uh, money to provide the food, the beer, we couldn't do it without them. Uh, Dave Hemke, Agonkin Studios. Um. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dave Hemke, again from Algonquin Studios. We are so honored to have all of you here tonight and to be your sponsors this evening. Um, a quick thing I could say about Algonquin Studios, we've been around for 16 years. At heart, we are software developers. We were founded in downtown Buffalo. I was one of the people who founded the company. And we started about five different businesses in that time. Uh, one of the things that we're launching right now is an incubator whose emphasis is going to be heavily on mentoring firms that are a good fit for us. Well, who's a good fit for us? Probably people who are interested in more software as a service businesses. So if you're interested in learning more about that, please come see me. And have a great night. Peter Smino with InfoTech Niagara. Raise your hand if you know what InfoTech Niagara is. Everyone else, come and see me afterward. All right, that's it. Let's enjoy the show and thank you all for coming. We're glad to be a sponsor. Thanks again. You want to uh, tell us about Fika? Me? Yes. <laughs> Stay away from the brownies. Well, um, <laughs> I'm Edward Tierney with a company called Brandmother, and uh, we're big believers in how entrepreneurs work and collaborate. And I've done a lot of work with entrepreneurs and mentoring around, the, around this town. But we started up a, an effort, a movement we'd like to become, uh, where entrepreneurs are the, are the lifeblood in the direction of where things are going. Be high tech, it could be low tech, it could be any type of entrepreneurial effort. But we as entrepreneurs need to get together in a grassroots effort because it's only through grassroots efforts that we change what we know to be institutional challenges and long standing obstacles to growing our community. So there's a group, it's called FICA Buffalo. It happens here the first Friday of every month this year, it's, or in July, it's going to be the second Friday because of the fourth. Uh, the, 
There's a Twitter account. It's called at Fika Buffalo. There's a Facebook page, Fika Buffalo. Go to it. It is open to all of us. If we all get involved, we can all make some changes. You got a question? Did you spell Fika? F-I-K-A. Thank you. It's a great question. It's actually a Swedish tradition. Um, so if you know any Swedish people, you can figure it out. But go to the website. It's, uh, it's actually how clusters in the early days were formed through collaboration. Feek of Buffalo. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. So now we're going to get into the actual startup grind with Dan Giganti. Um, I won't go over his whole bio because then you guys could all leave. That would be the event. But Dan is the founder and president of Unihu, a buy one, give one online retailer that sells artist designed t-shirts and donates matching shirts to people who need across 40 US cities. Launched in 2010, the company has grown to work with 89 non nonprofits and 105 artists across the country. Um, if you're involved in entrepreneurship in Buffalo, you probably were introduced to him as the guy who makes t-shirts. That's how I knew him. And there's a lot more to the story. So uh, I'm excited to be here. Dan's excited to be here. Let's show Dan that you're excited to be here, and we're going to get started. Woo! A lot of ways we get started, but start at the beginning. Uh, you went to school at UV for three years for computer engineering, and then you left and joined the Air Force. So, what was the reason behind that? Um, how did the Air Force Air Force influence you as an entrepreneur? Kind of walk us through those those early years and what was going on. Sure. Well, it wasn't that I was such a good student that I was able to finish in three years. I actually never finished, and I decided to join the Air Force. And it was really one of the best things I ever did. Um, turns out that I'm just better at learning uh, on the fly, on the job. And uh, books just, did, I've never studied for anything. And so I did fine not studying for computer science, but psychology, all those other classes just were my downfall. Um, so got to learn on the job in the Air Force that, you know, it was not a lot of training. It was more just figure it out. At least for me it was. Um, but it was really great. Uh, I, so I went to school for computer science. I was lucky enough to be a, a computer programmer in the Air Force. That was actually not guaranteed when I joined, so I could have ended up fixing planes, but it worked out. Um, and it was really a, a, a good experience, too, of um, having left Buffalo. And I honestly couldn't wait to get back. I, uh, I really I missed it, and uh, made me appreciate it more. A lot of people that maybe talk about leaving Buffalo and never have, and I think a lot of people that do end up coming back, and I was one of them. So you were in the Air Force for four years, shopping those computer skills, and then you were done with the Air Force, and kind of what happened next? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I always kind of thought it would be four years and come home. Um, I got a job uh, do, as a web developer at a company, and, East Aurora, um, and a couple years into that, um, realized I kind of always had this entrepreneur bug in me. Um, back from, I had a couple ideas in the Air Force that I worked on on the side, and so I always kind of, even though I was at this place in East Aurora, I thought to myself, like, I kind of want to do this myself. Um, I wasn't quite ready to do that. I, I left. Um, and started for a company that actually friends of mine from the Air Force had started. This was around 2000, now you know how old I am. Um, some friends had started a startup down in Alabama on a telecommute. Uh, my eventual partner at my company I was about to form joined with me. We both used to telecommute out of uh, our apartment, my apartment above Vindler's in East Aurora, um, which if you haven't seen their video, so good. Uh -huh. go check that out, it's so good. Um, and so we did that for a little bit, and then shortly after we left, so we were telecommuting, and which was a great experience too, and taught me to not ever hire a telecommuter. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, it was actually good because we would just work whenever we wanted to, and we could do whatever else we wanted the rest of the time, but we got the stuff done. Um, and we had a lot of people asking us if we could do work for them, and uh, in particular, my partner, Matt, was had a was doing a really good job at 
where we used to be, and the guy reached out to him and said, hey, we can't find anyone to do it, can you just do it for us? And so slowly the two of us decided to leave and we started Clever Method, uh, and that was in 2000. So Clever Method, that's a little ways back. What was it like starting a web development company in Western New York back then? Did you raise any money? How did you find customers? Was it grassroots? What, what happened? So it, it started out, it was, it was, like I said, just Matt and I, and it was pretty much, we had no overhead. We worked out of Matt's house, like we had a few servers in his basement, um, and it was just us. And then we hired a, uh, a friend of mine from the Air Force, moved to Buffalo, he was our first employee. Um, and a little bit after that, we added a third partner, uh, the two of them were still there. Um, and after that, we kind of, had a growth explosion, we got some big projects. I remember one day we, I think, hired three people in one day, and probably seven in a week or something. It was kind of crazy. Um, lucky enough to have a couple people that worked with me at Clever Method here. So, good to see you. Um, and um, yeah, in the beginning it was a lot of work. Uh, it's kind of funny because I'm, we'll probably get to this later, but in that mode now with a new uh, company, um, in the beginning, it's just a lot of hard work. You're doing everything. I remember the first the, the hire we had that um, when I had when I could stop doing invoicing and paying the bills and going to the bank and getting the mail and stuff like that. Um, but it turned out to be uh, all worth it. You're going pretty good with Clever Method. It's 2010. You had 34 employees. You're doing a couple million dollars in revenue. You work with big name companies, and then you decided to leave. You decided to form you and who and go from your own words a nerd in the web development industry to a uh, something in the fashion industry. Why did you make that change? Why did you feel that um, that was the right decision for you? So I've always been involved in, in trying to give back. Um, I was at the time on the board of a few organizations like March of Dimes and the American Cancer Society and Infotech Niagara. Russia Buffalo. Um, when I watched an interview of Blake McCoskey of Tom Shoes, I'm sure a lot of people know Tom Shoes, and he explained the buy one, give one model of Tom's, and I just had this, you know, aha moment that I could do a similar thing with t-shirts. And I just love the concept of weaving, uh, giving into a, a for-profit business. So it didn't have to be working and then giving, but doing it together. So, um, I have a lot of ideas. This was one that I couldn't stop thinking about. And uh, about a year after I had it, in the timing of it, it was right around um, Jet Blue had a promotion called All You Can Jet. And I thought this was such a great opportunity to launch not only in one city in Buffalo, I didn't want to be another Buffalo shirt company. Um, so we launched in eight cities, and I was able to do that via Jet Blue. Um, and yeah, it's been a great learning process to that too. Like, like you said, a nerd in a fashion, owning a fashion company. Um, but we've uh, figured it out all along the way. Um, kind of like I mentioned, I've never studied for anything. I don't really, I'm not really afraid to jump into anything and learn as I go. So it's been a great learning experience. Can you walk us through the business plan, the business model for you and who? I'm not sure if everybody's. 100% familiar with, with what you do um, and how you do it. Yeah, sure. So inspired by uh, Tom's and the buy one, give one model. And what I love about the buy one, give one model is it's very clear what's being given. It's not a portion of proceeds. It's not 10% of it. It's, it's you, when we sell a shirt, we donate the same shirt to someone in need. Um, so we work with artists across the country. We're now in 40 cities. We expanded uh, from eight to 32 and then to 40 in the subsequent years. Um, and I actually did it via another JetBlue promotion um, in 2011, the look of my girlfriend to find out the time, because she uh, hated that period. Because I was gone for 90 days, I visited 30 cities in 90 days, and we expanded into uh, new cities. So we work with artists in each of the cities to design the shirts. Like I'm wearing a shirt designed by a guy in San Francisco. So every time we sell this shirt, we donate a matching shirt or meals if you chose uh, 
to an organization organization in the hometown of the artist. And this would go to one of our San Francisco organizations. Um, we give the artist a dollar per shirt sold. We're trying to promote what they do on a national level. And uh, it's a very uh, local thing. We just do it in many cities. So San Francisco people are probably drawn to the San Francisco shirts helping San Francisco people in need. And it's designed by a San Francisco artist. So there's a lot about the city that uh, so that's the basic model of it, it's pretty simple. We just, uh, I'm not sure if now's a good time to talk about it, but we've kind of expanded on that a little bit. Um, since we help people in the US, it was actually um, April of, of 2012 when a garment factory in Bangladesh collapsed and 1,100 people died. And a friend of mine pointed out, because he asked me, he's like, well, where are your shirts made? So, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and it made me think, not only um, because of that, but this is a great opportunity to shift our focus to getting our shirts made in the U.S. to impact American jobs, help more American people than just the ones we were donating to. So I looked around at some shirt companies, um, didn't really like the American-made options. Um, I like the one a little more now because they finally got rid of their CEO. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but I didn't want to use them at the time. And so I thought, well, I'll just make my own shirts, um, thinking that I'd figure out how to do that. I've learned that that's a very hard thing to do. Um, but we're doing it. We had a Kickstarter, uh, Indiegogo campaign in last fall, um, and um, we now are almost done. So it's taken almost a year to, to make our new shirts. But we found a factory in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania to make our shirts and dye our shirts. Crowdfunding is very hot right now. You went through a crowdfunding campaign that was successful, and uh, your goal was twenty-five thousand dollars, and you raised twenty-five thousand dollars and twenty-five thousand eighteen dollars. So you beat it by eighteen dollars. What lessons did you learn from that crowdfunding campaign, and what knowledge could you share for somebody who might be thinking of starting a crowdfunding campaign? Yeah, I learned a lot. It's, it's a lot of work. It's pretty much your full-time job for the time that the campaign happens. And a lot of it happens before. Um, there's a couple different kinds of campaigns. A lot of them have a big start, and then it gets really hard and lonely in the middle, and then a flurry at the end to convince everyone to help you get over the hump, which is what happened to us. Um, and I, I, I did learn a lot, and I love talking about it. If anyone has a campaign that they're um, thinking of launching, I'd love to talk to you about it. Although, um, much to my girlfriend's chagrin because I overextend myself. But I love talking about ideas, but I'll stop talking about her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and actually, uh, a friend in the audience who I'm trying to help him uh, with his upcoming crowdfunding campaign. I'm wearing sandals right now. These are Atingas. You might have uh, heard of them from uh, Startup Weekend. These were made in uh, Rwanda, and uh, it's a really great thing that they're doing, and they have a crowdfunding campaign that you'll be hearing more about later. But if anyone has any, any crowdfunding campaigns, it's, it's probably longer than we have to talk about now, but I do have some great ideas for how a campaign can, can be successful. You, you and you, how did that get started? Did you raise any money? Um, you know, you kind of launched a lot of cities at once that require a lot of capital. You quit Clever Method, or you left Clever Method. Um, what were the financials behind you and him? Yeah, so it, you and who's always been run on a, a shoestring budget. Uh, I didn't go to the bank when I left Clever Method. It was enough to survive for a few months. Um, I look back, and sometimes I think that I probably should have tried to raise money. Um, if you don't, it just takes that much longer. Uh, but it's tough because, and I was talking to a friend now who's trying to do a second round soon. And he's not looking forward to it because it's like all you do during that time is try to raise money. And he's trying to build this business and you kind of have to build, you're either raising revenue or you're raising you know, investment and it's tough to do both. So we, we, we didn't take it uh, or didn't even pursue to do it, mostly because I just thought it was so hard to do. Uh, and I, I know that it's getting easier, which is good. Um, but yeah, no, it's always been a shoestring budget that uh, trip that I made uh, the 30 cities, 90 days, I basically stayed on friends' couches, lived off cliff bars, 
and just pounded the pavement. And um, which is good, you know, it's good. To, you know, it's made a lot of it, um, I don't say more meaningful, but you know, it's kind of earned everything that we've we've done. Uh, it's been hard, but it, what we do is very rewarding. So when I would go around to these different organizations and see the people that were helping and the people that work there on a day-to-day -day basis, it wasn't, you know, I don't really complain about anything anymore because I learned there's a lot of people in our country that are really hurting, and so anything that comes out that seems like it could be a big deal really isn't, so. Awesome. You who is focused on giving, why is it important for entrepreneurs to give before you get something? Yeah, that's a great saying that uh, Brad Feld, if you've heard of him, talks about. Um, he wrote the book, uh, Startup Communities. I had a chance to uh, go to Boulder in April uh, for on behalf of 43 North, which I'm, I'm sure you've probably all heard of. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so I emailed Brad Feld because I was going to Boulder. And he got back to me like an hour later which is amazing. It actually made me feel bad because I have like a thousand emails in my inbox and I haven't gotten back to every once in a while. I either respond to someone in two minutes or it could be two weeks. It's like there's nothing in between because it just gets buried. But Brad Feld, who's got to be twice as busy as I am, got back to me and it's because he believes in this, uh, this philosophy, and I do too, which is give before you get. So what that means is, kind of like I volunteered, you want to talk about a crowdfunded campaign or some idea you have, I'll talk to you about it and I'm not really worried about what's going to come out of it. I'm not thinking to myself, like, well, what's, going to, what's in it for me? And so the attitude you have is just to, to help other people out and to, to offer advice and to, to be there for someone else. And you don't do it thinking, what can I get out of this? You just do it. That's the get before you get. You're not thinking about the get part. But the thing is, is you, you do end up getting. Like that's, it's not that you do it for that, but that's the point. When you, when you do just give, um, I don't want to say the kindness of your heart, it's more just, I don't know the, the 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 spirit of it, you know, and I don't have to uh, you know tell remind anyone that it's a great city we have here, the city of good neighbors, and so I'm sure all of us are uh, willing to do that. And I think that's how the our startup community can can grow even more than it than it has. You won Crowley Webb's 25 hour work day. So while we're on the topic of getting things, kind of walk us through that process. What is a 25-hour workday? How did that benefit you? Sure. I'm glad we're not showing the video because I don't think I've ever watched it without crying. Um, it was a great experience. If you're not familiar with it, Crowley Webb had a contest. Uh, it was their 25th year, their 25th anniversary. And so they said they remembered what it was like to be a startup and they wanted to get back to a lucky startup. And we were able to become that lucky startup uh, we actually beat out Community Beer Works, which I was worried about going up against beer. But, uh, <laughs> but we, I, um, I actually wrote a little Facebook app that helped us um, win the contest, I think. Um, and what it was was, uh, like, like it said, a 25 hour workday. So 42 of their, at the time, 45 people worked 25 straight hours on UNU. So we came up, they came up with a new logo, a new brand strategy, slogans, website design, like everything. They organized a photo shoot. I mean, we estimated we got about $150,000 worth of work for free. Uh, it was such a great boost for a startup, especially uh, one that was trying to be a national company like we were. We then looked the part, like um, before we were doing our best, but this really kind of helped in, in so many ways. Uh, and it was great too because we ended up launching at South by Southwest, the new site which is sometimes good to have a big stage to do that because it happened. Like other times it could not, right? So I didn't sleep for three weeks, but we got it done. And um, yeah, it was just really a great experience. And, um, and I think they've told us too that they got a lot out of it. It was a really great bonding experience for the whole company to, to do that and to have fun and to work on a company that gave back. I think they appreciated that too. And so, uh, yeah, it was just a really, it's definitely, um, one of the, the luckiest things that's happened to us, and we definitely benefit. When you receive things like that as an entrepreneur, do you feel a sense of obligation or, um, I don't want to say a debt, but do you think that that influences you and um, helps you give back, knowing that you had received something so valuable in the past? 
Um, well, I think I had that attitude before, so I, I think it just kind of fit into that. Um, and who knows, maybe that's why we were able to win, um, just from like our karma standpoint or something. So I don't think anything in particular um, with that, other than I would have anyways. Does that make sense? I don't know if I answered that. Yeah, no, you're giving is definitely part of who you are. So you mentioned your girlfriend a couple times. So <laughs> you and who, you know, that's it's enough to keep you busy, but not for you. Um, so 19 Ideas is uh, the other business that you're partnered with. You are a web developer there. You know, walk us through 19 Ideas. What do you do there? Why did you feel, um, or why did you make the, the switch? Well, you're also, you're doing fashion thing, you're, you're getting kind of back to the web development and maybe some other things you're interested in. Yeah, so um, Katie started Night Stand Ideas uh, a few years ago, and it was just her at one point focusing on, um, you know, public relations and, and marketing. And she had slowly grown, she hired an employee um, we shared space at the Trimane. I occasionally did, I guess you can take the nerd, uh, the boy out of the nerdness, but not the nerd out of the boy, maybe? I don't know. Um, I can't help it, right? I just like working in technology. And so I would do occasional help for some of the clients, but uh, really what it was was kind of a combination of a couple things and why I decided to join Night Ideas full time at the beginning of the year and, and try to run both companies at the same time. Um, is one, I see a lot of opportunity and, and, and it, I kind of missed having a team and working together in that. So it's been great to do that. Um, and, and, and I think that we can do really great things. But also I kind of had this epiphany and I think this is maybe good to hear if you are in a startup or a, or a small company. And um, it was a day I had spent probably 10 hours um, printing and shipping shirts. So we have our own printer that we print small runs on. And literally like a 10 hour day. And and I thought to myself, I mean, there's gotta be a better way. And, and it occurred to me, I had a, 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 someone who had been volunteering for a couple years with us that wasn't anymore. And I realized that I missed him. And I thought, well, I could really probably do something that I'm good at, the skill that I have and work some, time, some hours doing that work and to be able to pay for a full week of him doing it. And it was like this epiphany that I think sometimes you don't really realize. So it's like, you know, it was a little bit of a leap of faith to do that, but it's been great because now we heard uh, him full time and it allowed me to focus on more of the big picture stuff and not the printing and shipping and the really like, nitty gritty stuff. Um, and I had more time to focus on not only doing some time, but really growing and acting ideas and, and having them both kind of work together, which has been great. So we asked uh, Leslie Zemsky, the last startup grind. She works with her husband. Uh, how's it working with your significant other? other? Uh, I plead the fifth. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's really great. It's, it, it's, it is a challenge because honestly, we, um, it's, the great part is that we're together like all the time. But that could be a bad thing because it's hard to have separation. So like it might be, that we go out and, and we're gonna end up talking about work because it's just, and I think Leslie said the same thing. I was definitely paying attention when she was talking about it. Um, and so there's pros and cons and we're, we're, and we're learning, you know, we're trying to figure out what works, uh, what doesn't. We've talked to friends, um, our friends Patrick and Brandon own Block Club together and they're together. And so it's been good to know that it's not just us, you know, and to learn maybe some things that they do than to try to get some separation. Uh, and, and so we're learning, um, but you know I wouldn't I wouldn't trade it in for anything. Good answer. At <laughs> Nineteen um, Ideas and Clever Method, you work with some you do work with some big names, but you also work with um, you know, some smaller names, smaller businesses. As an entrepreneur, is it important to look at those smaller opportunities or just look at bigger opportunities? Bigger companies. So uh, I'm not sure what, uh, I, I feel like I've heard other people have a different opinion than I do on this, but the way I look at it is, is I, don't, I don't really turn away anything too small. Because um, you never know what might come out of that is kind of the way I look at it. And, and I don't know, maybe this relates to the give before you get. But um, and, and one of the things that I would always say back at, at 
uh, Clever Method. The best thing that happened to us would be when, when our contact left their job, which happens a lot, because they would go to another company and they loved us so much that the first thing they did was try to bring us in to do the work there. Um, and so that's, again, it's, it's not like something you're thinking in the back of your head, maybe when you're working on a smaller project, but you just never know. And so you do the same great work for everyone and you know, word spreads and it's, so I, I think that you can work it in and you don't have to, you know, turn away small jobs. I mean, you, you have to maybe do things differently to, to make them be uh, uh, efficient. But to me, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't like to turn away opportunities. Granted, I have a hard time saying no, so it kind of maybe fits into that. Maybe sometimes it's, it's, it would be good to do that, but I think especially when you're starting out, Especially that's that's when you want to you know you're creating a, a, a name for yourself and, and just the more opportunities you have to meet people and, and do great work. So for me, I wouldn't turn it away. Perfect segue. Uh, it's hard to say no. Uh, twenty six shirts is another business that you're involved with. So what does twenty six shirts do? How's that different than you and who? Has it taught you anything um, that you've used in you and who's business model? Yeah, so um, we've kind of been in this holding pattern with you and who because we don't have our new shirts yet. Um, and in fact, when orders come in, like I hope it's not one of our new and who shirts, which is not a good position to be in when you own a shirt company. So I don't want to sell our shirts because it's kind of a pain to fulfill them right now. So actually, it was a, a friend uh, at Algonquin Studios who introduced me to Del Reed, who had the idea for uh, 26 shirts. And I saw him. Dell uh, is the, the man behind Bill's Mafia. You've probably heard of Bill's Mafia. He has a great big following for that. And he had this idea. He's a great guy, too. He uh, just really giving guy. We, we could honor him really great. He had this idea for 26 shirts. was a shirt, different shirt every two weeks. And uh, all the profits would be donated to a family in need. And the shirts would be about the bills. Because that's a big part of his life. Um, and so I reached out to him and said, well, who's going to print those shirts? because it was very similar to you and who, and that it was shirts that do good. Um, and he was gonna use uh, Crowds Teespring or, or whatever it's called. And I said, well, we can print them. And so we started working together, and um, we've now, it's almost becoming like a, it basically is a you and who brand that we work on together. Um, and we have some plans to expand that a little slower than I've done in the past, but we'd like to do it in other cities and, and do it with other sports. Because as big as a Bills fan, he is, I'm a huge Sabres fan, so we, we definitely have to get some Sabres shirts out there. Um, and do this in other cities, and what's been good about it is, it, you know, things happen for a reason, or, or at least I try to look at the positive of everything. So with this odd period we've been at, you knew it's given me a chance to focus on 26 shirts, and there's a lot of great things about it that, you know, I'm going to be, I learned from, and I might be able to tweak the you knew model to, to enhance it. Basically, every time we do anything, we try to learn from it. You know, if that's, you know, tweak it. I mean, if it worked, let's do more of it. If it didn't work, let's do something different. So this has been a good opportunity to do something a little different, similar, and then and learn from it. So, you and who, 19 ideas, 26 shirts. What advice can you give entrepreneurs and people to manage their time <laughs> or still be effective and I might be the wrong person to talk to you about time management skills. Um, and I, probably, I want to mention someone else again, but I don't want her to get mad at me. But as unorganized as I am, I'm lucky enough that my girlfriend and, and business partner is very organized, and it's a huge help. Um, but that said, I do think, uh, you know, I've read, you know, about being able to say no sometimes to the right opportunity because, you know, you might pass up a good opportunity for a great one. Like I said, it's just, I'm not the right person to talk to you about that because I have a hard time saying no. It's worked out for me so far, so it's hard to complain. Um, but I think a lot of it is just, you know, I keep up on different um, blogs or I try to read about different tips. I try to incorporate different things just to try to to help, you know, improve. I try to look at everything that happens, you know, as a learning opportunity, which helps, I think, when like there's really no, um, there's no, what, what are this? It's, uh, it's not win or lose, it's win or learn, right? So if you look at things that way, um, everything that happens you can learn from. And so, which 
partly why I like to do a lot of things, because I learn a lot of things and everything, you know, improve, helps to improve for the next time. But, um, so if you want time management skills, just don't, don't talk to me about that. You traveled very extensively with you and who, you've seen a lot of cities. What can Buffalo learn from these different cities and what city can Buffalo learn the most from? Well, I, a few of my favorite cities um, from the traveling I've done are uh, Chicago, uh, and and I really love Boulder. When I was in Boulder for the, you know, like I said, trying to um, spread the word about 43 North. When I first got to Boulder, I was um, on the phone with Katie, and I was like, we might need to move to Boulder because it's awesome. Uh, but then by the end of it, I thought to myself, I just let's just make Buffalo more like Boulder. Uh, and you know, Boulder wasn't Boulder. Five years ago, a couple of you have heard this joke, so you're going to hate it. It was a pebble, right? It became a boulder. No, but um, <laughs> the point being is it takes momentum. They've got a lot of momentum going. But if it wasn't like that five years ago, and we're probably even ahead of where they were, Boulder works because it's close to Denver. Uh, boulder, what's great about Boulder is it's a small town, and they have the highest concentration of, like, I think, I think there's more people that are in a startup than aren't, literally. Like, if you look at the population, and so what's great about that is you get this um, collision density that people talk about, which I really like. And we're, we're starting to get some momentum here. And I think that the way we can get the collision density is trying to locate like-minded businesses in, in similar areas. Because the collision density means that, uh, and I saw this in Boulder, I, it reminded me of when I was at South by Southwest. You would just go to a, a coffee shop and like every conversation that I would overhear, I like, knew what they were talking about. It would be tacky or you know speaking my language. And it, not on purpose, it's just everyone there in that area was like that. So the random collisions being, next thing you know, I'm talking to them, and a year later, we have the next startup. It's just getting people together. So I think one thing we can learn um, from like a boulder uh, in that regard is trying to, to put things in, in similar locations, to get like-minded people in similar locations. Um, and, and really what it, what it comes down to is momentum. We're starting to get it now. It's one of the things I like about 43 North is trying to add to that momentum and bring more startups here. Because uh, once you start getting the momentum, you get a few exits. The people that um, sold the company invest in more companies, and there's and that's what's happened to kind of Boulder. Uh, I think it would be great if we got an accelerator here, um, in addition to the uh, like incubators and the support space. Um, and that's again, I think what happened in Boulder is where Techstars was started. Um, so I, I focused a lot on Boulder, but I think that's an area that, you know, a, it's a good city to look at in terms of what we want to do to improve or help increase our startup scene here. You've been involved with the Buffalo startup scene for a while. How's it changed? What have you seen that's gotten better? What can we still improve upon? Well, I think the greatest thing that happened to the startup scene here was uh, the Open Coffee Club that Steve Poland started, probably in 2010. It doesn't need any more, but for that couple years that it did, it was a really great uh, place that like-minded people came together. And it was more the, um, like the doers, you know, it was the, the people that wanted to start companies uh, that, that like to do work. And a lot of things came out of it. The group from that was the, what started um, the startup weekend that happened. Steve had ran a lot of the bar camps. I did a bar camp with Clark and Nick. We met you know, through Open Coffee. Um, I was at the Open Coffee at Boulder. They had like 45 people there. It definitely made me think about starting it up again. Um, but I, I do have a lot of things going on. It'd be great if someone else wanted to start Open Coffee up again, um, because it's just a great place for like-minded people to come together. Um, what was the question? <laughs> How's it changed? Uh, how can we get better? How's it gotten better? It's, it's changed, in, in you, you've, like I said, I mentioned 43 North, the 80 didn't exist, this place we're in didn't exist. This is definitely stuff that wasn't around a couple years ago. Uh, let alone 10 years ago, none of this was around. So, and, and I think we're, like, what's gonna change is as we get momentum. It's because as you get more momentum, more things happen. I mean, nothing draws a crowd like a crowd. So as we get more things happening, more people wanna be there, 
and then more, you know, more opportunities will come out of it. So I just think it's events like this, like thank you, let's give a round of applause for Evan. <laughs> I think the startup grind is a great thing. It's, there's, there's other things that are happening. There's other things that could happen. Um, what's great about Buffalo too is I feel like it's, it's small enough that you can you can do things if you if you want to if you want to make a difference. So if you have that idea for some group that you want to get together or some event you want to do, just do it. Uh, you can. And um, and I think as more people do that, more people see that, and more things start happening. And I, I, I talk about all the momentum and. and we're getting it, and what's happening is momentum breeds more momentum, which breeds more momentum. Cool. You had a good amount of publicity recently for something you did with 19 Ideas, which was where should the Bills Stadium go? So it's still a topic. You know, Trump is tweeting out things, and who knows? But where do you think it should go? And uh, don't say Toronto. <laughs> Yeah, that was a, a fun project. I actually hatched the idea at um, OpenHack. I don't know if you know any developers out there know about OpenHack. Nick uh, Caranto started. It's cool. Plays every other Tuesday. I think people just show up at Court Buffalo and hack on things. And so I had this idea. Um, I had worked on a site last year for uh, Roadless Travel Productions, which was a Google Maps mashup where you could like drop a pin and write a story about um, your past. And so knowing that work I've done with that, I had this idea, because I, everyone has an idea where the stadium should go, and having worked with the, the API, I thought, well, I could make a little app where I could drop the stadium so I could see, because I'd done that like manually with a screenshot. Other people have probably done that too, right? You take a screenshot of Google Maps, you cut out the stadium. So um, when I showed that, that I was going to do that, some people at uh, Open Act were like, well, I want to put it somewhere. So. I, I ended up making a little app out of it. We made it look nice, and you can save it and tweet about it. Where do I want it to go? I think it should go um, as close to the downtown core as possible without doing you know too much displacement of anything. Um, and my hope is that maybe the uh, Pagula ends up with the team and, and gets it as close to the arena as possible, share the parking that's there, and um, I just think that makes the most sense. I saw someone, one of the most popular places was Riverbend, and this was before uh, uh, the, um, Elon Musk you know, came out with and all that, so that's definitely not going to happen anymore because I think we need more space there for that, which is great news. But it would have been a good spot. It definitely fits on the map. Favorite Buffalo summertime activity with all of your free time? <laughs> um, I, I don't have a lot of free time, but um, really it's just, there's so much to do. Uh, sometimes it's hard, right? We jam everything into like the three months, and so there's it's so it's really just trying to do uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I like the things with the local flair. Like I went to Allen West. I didn't even go to the Allen Talent Festival. Um, City of Nights happening this weekend. Actually, Night the Idea is the sponsor of that. Uh, we're really ha happy to be a part of that. It's a really great event. If you haven't been down there, you should definitely think about going. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, there's so much to do. I think it's just a matter of trying to do it all, and that might take a couple of years because there's literally probably like three things going on every weekend. So I, I think that, that just try to experience all of it. I don't know that it's hard, it's hard to pick a. My favorite would be would be watching uh, Stanley Cup Finals in June with the Sabres playing. So hopefully that'll happen in a couple of years. You mentioned uh, Riverbend, the uh, Harbor Center with the stadium. In your opinion, what is the most exciting new development, you know, whether it's real estate or say public announcement uh, to happen uh, to come to Buffalo recently? Um, well, I have to tip my hat to the governor. I think that the Buffalo Billion has probably been the best thing that's ever happened in this area. Um, and the little piece of it, the five million for 43 North, I think is the is a great idea. I think that um, sure it's great to give 250 million to um, the solar place to move here, and I'm really glad they did that. But I think that that five million and those 11 companies, I think it's just a different way to do it. It's sort of the ground up versus like.
big money in bringing people here. I, I, I joke that we're more likely for the next Facebook to start here than we are to convince them to move here. Um, so I, I think investing in, in startups like that is, so that's why I think that particular piece I like a lot, um, and just the whole Buffalo Million in general, because then if you look at the two projects that I mentioned alone, uh, are really, really great. Awesome. So this is the last question, and I asked to Leslie, and I think it's a very pertinent question, and one that's on every Buffaloian's mind. If Buffalo is to succeed, succeed, it needs more of blank. Well, honestly, it, it's jobs is what we need more of. And, and, and so I believe that those are gonna come out of startups. That's why I like the startup scene. Um, and so what, what they need for that is more help for that. Like, so what we need is, and, and it's happening, which is great. That's the momentum that I have about it. It's getting easier to start a company. Things like uh, CED Labs um, and, and Dig, places like that that are helping to encourage the startup scene. That's, I think we need more startups. That's what I would like to see. I would love to see more, um, I would love to see, that's so why I'm so, I mean, I love Startup Weekend, so they're just, the, they're so much fun. You, if anyone here, we're gonna have it here in DIG at the end of October, um, definitely keep an eye out for that. I'm one of the organizers, but come the weekend, I participate because it's so much fun. Um, I would love to see a little project come out of that that actually did something. I, I, I think I, Time Hop is an app that I use like every day. It's a really great app. I think that I came out of a startup weekend. I think it'd be fun to have one of those. It's obviously not going to lead to, um, you know, it's, it's the renaissance is, renaissance is already happening. Um, I think we just need to to keep keep at it. Awesome. Well, thanks, Dan. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. Question. Adam? Um, so I just moved back to Portland, Oregon. Did you go to Portland for your uh, you and who idea? Because they're really big into their local artists and keeping things local and whatnot. I was just wondering if you check out Portland. I, I did, yeah. I, was, I got to go to the first year and then back the second year. Um, and it was, what was interesting is I was there a short period on the first time that I, I didn't go. East? Does that sound right? Yeah, Southeast. But the second time I went there, I did. I got to explore a lot more, and I really loved Portland. I think it's great. I met with, they actually have a company there that was upcycling shirts, uh, and I thought about using them at the times for, for you and you. It didn't work out to be a good fit, whatever, but um, the other great thing that was in Portland was, so I would wander around with my big backpack and everything in it, and I was at a store and the woman was asking me like, what's going on, I explained her about Portland, and she loved the idea, I mean, I was talking about you and Duke, and she loved the idea of it, and um, it was just good to hear, because I think that was the first year, just a reinforcement of that, you know, people thought it was a good idea that helped, helped keep things going. But um, yeah, I love, I love Portland, it's a great, great city. Cool, any other questions? Drew? There's like a lot of shirt companies around here, what's that here the uh, a couple things. So we are the only one, I think, that um, has the giving component. So uh, it's not just another shirt company. And what's one of the things I mentioned how we've learned some things about Twice of Shirts. They're, with, with the buy one, get one shirts, it's two shirts, like they're a little bit pricey because we have to cover the two shirts. Um, 26 shirts, the way we do it, we are able to lower that cost a little bit. So it's more on par with a regular shirt. And so in my mind, it seems like a no-brainer. You could buy a regular shirt, or you could buy one that we, you know, help a family in need. Um, in addition to that, the shirts that we use um, are some of the softest shirts that you can get. And it was one of my uh, criteria for doing it myself is I didn't want to sacrifice quality for just the Made in USA, right? So we worked, you know, tirelessly with the the mills and the dye facility to get it, they're actually gonna be even softer than the shirts that we used to use. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. And so at that point too, it'll be the only shirt 
uh, it'll be made in America, it'll be super soft, and it'll you know help someone. So I think that sets us apart. Yeah, I would love to. Uh, I love the concept of buy one, give ones. I, like, I love everything about that because I would love helping someone with an idea and then the buy one, give one. It's kind of how um, Chris and the thing is, it's different. They're not a buy one, give one. And I love what they do too because they really empower the people that uh, make the shoes here. And so, but it's still similar enough that I think that's how we started, that's how we got together. But yeah, I would love to. Can't wait to hear about it. My friends. Uh, I say that because I think, and it's funny because uh, I met with a friend earlier today for a podcast that he has. We were talking about the campaign, and I think that partly what was funny was uh, I think that most of the twenty-five thousand dollars worth of you know through that campaign were people just supporting me. which is a really great feeling. And I think it's, what's funny about it is they didn't realize that we were making our own shirts. So they thought we were just printing shirts. So it's like, what's taking so long? Because I think they didn't even, it didn't matter what they were doing, they were just supporting me. Awesome. Nick? You said that the, uh, the startup renaissance is we're right in the middle of it right now for Buffalo. I definitely agree with you, but I really feel like that unless you're already a part of it or you're looking to be a part of it, so you're looking for it, it's, yeah, unless you're a part of either of those two groups, it's really underground or other people just have no idea. I do think that we can, if, for people who aren't interested in spreading the word, I do think we can tell people about it. Because I think that at, at its core, a lot of people are interested in at least hearing about this kind of stuff, regardless of if you're from here or not. But how do you tell them how to break into it? How do you Invite them to start a grind. Yes. <laughs> well, I think that we're in the beginning of it. I probably wouldn't say that we're in the middle of it. I think it's definitely something, it, it doesn't have to necessarily take time, but it takes that momentum that I talked about. And what that means is that the more things that happen, the more likely people are going to hear about it. Because, and we, we, we try hard, like with the startup weekends that we've done, to reach everyone. I think that's a great opportunity to get to know what's going on and to, to learn to meet people in the, in the in the area or that are interested in that and then maybe to talk about your startup and even at that like we feel like we're reaching everyone but like I know that we're not it's just really it's hard to do that so some of it is on you it's on the people we try to do our best to to get it out there events like this all the events so the thing is like invite a few of your friends and that's how they'll learn about it I think we all did that a little bit so the more events, the, the more um, that good things happen and people talk about it. Uh, as much as you know, I live in the digital world, like old media is still a huge way that a lot of people get their, their information. Uh, and so the more good things that happen, the more likely um, that, that stuff gets talked about, the more people can see it. And so that's again, it's back to the momentum. So it's gonna take a little bit of time, but Hopefully, uh, eventually, everyone will, will find out about it. Cool. Biran, you have a question? Um, yes. So, when you left your first company to start You and Who, um, I want to know, can you talk a little bit about just uh, your thought process for that? More, um, I know, because you spoke about it a little bit, but kind of, was it like a drive to try something different, to be a serial entrepreneur, to feel like you can do something or build something significant again? Or was it really just your drive to give back, or you know, a mix of the two? I think a lot of it for you and who was that, like I said, I have a lot of different ideas, um, and that was one that just kept coming back that I just couldn't shake. And one of the things, I, I mean, I tell people a lot that ideas are worth nothing. It's I didn't make this up, but ideas are worth nothing. It's all about the execution. I've actually since learned that 
you need to also for people to know about it. So it's, uh, but in terms of that, what I mean by that is if you have an idea, like tell people about it. Like some people get afraid to tell people about it. If it's a good enough idea, like someone's not gonna steal it and go do it because the hard part is doing it. And so the more you talk about it, the better uh, the feedback that you get. So I would tell people a lot about my ideas. Some people I know are very sick of hearing about my ideas. Um, this one, everyone that I told loved it. And so it helped to shape it and, and enhance it. And so, you know, uh, so, so I think with that one, I had, I had a lot of, you know, I, I couldn't shake it. So that's when I decided, I was like, that's it. I'm just gonna leave and, and do it. And I think it helped that, you know, if I was on the fence about it, uh, my friend Clark had had a great experience with the um, uh, All You Can Jet the year before I did it. He got a lot of press out of a little project he did. Um, and I was like, well, if he can do that, like, I could get a lot of, you know, good momentum out of uh, the All You Can Jet. So I'm kind of glad that happened when it did because it was kind of the kick I needed to, to jump and start, which was kind of nuts, but, you know, sometimes you just got to say, um, yeah, what the, I don't want to, yeah, okay. Uh, I recently met with Dell, as I told you, and he said he found it strange that some of the 26 shirts didn't do as well as others, um, based on timing and stuff like that. Have you noticed the same thing with you and who, and maybe why? A lot of it is a mystery to me. Um, like some shirts that are, 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 in my mind, like great. A lot of some of it's timing. Um, I think that one of the things that is, is helpful for 26 shirts and was one of the things that um, we're, we're going to try to tweak a little bit with you too is it's a short time frame. They're only available for two weeks, and, and and the family that we're helping really gets behind that, and they do a lot to spread the word. Whereas with you and who it was. Uh, we hoped that the organizations would do a lot of promotion for us, and they, they like receiving shirts. It's great, but it's not, it's it's too much to ask to, for them to push it a lot. So we might actually change that. Um, and so with twenty six shirts, in terms, of, in terms of some doing well, some not. Some of it is based on the family and how much they do. Uh, some of it is timing. Some of it uh, like um, we had a shirt for uh, Nikel Roby. It was a right after he had a great game, and like we sold a lot of shirts. It's a little bit harder to sell Bill's shirts now. It'll probably get a little bit easier until they lose. <laughs> Hopefully they won't, but if they win a game, uh, this is the, usually like right around training camp is the highest, right? Because we're all on hope, and like this is the year, and everything's good. That's gonna be a great time to sell shirts. And if they win the first game, great, you know? Um, and then if they lose, it would probably just drop off. So literally though, it's, it's just a kind of crapshoot. Like even like a, a great design could not, one of the ones that Dell and I both like the most, <laughs> I might, it's in the bottom of how many it's sold. And some other ones, it's, so some of that is just. Yeah, you told me about the shorts one, you were surprised that they That one too, um, it's been kind of fun because I see the, when the orders come in, uh, some of the names uh, in terms of um, I'm trying to think of some, like Billy Shaw, you guys probably know about a bunch of shirts. Just seeing some of the older players like buying some of the shirts is kind of neat. Awesome. Well, <clears throat> if anybody else has questions, um, please find Dan afterwards. Oh, well, we got it. I have a question. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, uh, I have a question about if you're interested in starting like, an organization that's a more social based mission, like how is the best way to go about getting? I guess it really depends, um, but I'd love to talk about it. For, you know, it's, it, it's um, it, it really, every, everything, every idea, is, everything's different, you know what I mean? But I bet if we talked about it, I could probably help you. Yeah, I'm Michelle Bowman. I'm from Chicago. Um, I The question is, are you seeing any resistance to positive change, and um, where have you seen that resistance to change? I don't know that I, I, I am. I don't know if other people are. Um, I think that it's been, it's been great to see 
so much, uh, so many good things happening. And I'll say it again, but I think that that's contributing to the momentum too. If we could get the Bills or the Sabres to win, uh, it, it would be amazing. Like I swear to God, like everything good, you know, because a lot of it is, um, one thing that I've seen that's changed on the positive side is, is I used to get on people about being so negative. We were so hard on ourselves. And like I'm seeing less of that, which is great. Um, and and it's, a, it's another momentum thing too. That's why I joke that if if one of our sports teams won the big one, we would it would explode. Like everyone would have all this confidence. We would just do it would be great. So I'm all for that happening. Awesome. Any uh, any other questions? I have a question about time. Was there ever a point in time that you thought you just moved too fast? Because for my business, I started just like a year ago. It's like three cities, but I feel like, okay, I'm moving too fast, like I need to take time back. Was there a point in time when you felt that way? I haven't, because I don't think like that, but I've had a lot of people tell me that I should. So I can see where you're coming from. So in that sense, it's good to surround yourself with, I read a book um, back when I was in the Air Force, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. And one of the things he talked about was like a, a master like a group of, of people and, and so it's why some of these groups that could exist you know that you can go to um, I know Neil has a group of um, are you still doing that uh, yeah. just so talking to people um, what's interesting too is like you can go to like a, a business networking group or like the uh, micro what's it called micro business meetup micro business meetup and it's funny because they're all going to have the same problems it doesn't matter what industry it is like the same things kind of come up. So it's good to talk to other people. It could be a different industry and, and you can explain what's going on and they've probably had a similar thing happen. So what I would say is you you want to have different people that you can talk to because um, you don't want to do it in like an echo chamber of everyone thinking the same thing. So it's been good. I've, I've had a chance to work with some great people. I've mentioned it. My girlfriend balances me out very well. We work really well together. So try to find someone that can, can do that. Um, I would be not the right person to talk to you about that. But someone else probably is. Awesome. Again? Uh, so we got into management and business. Uh, what do you consider sort of have to do to get everything set up to your needs for your company? Uh, for the shirts? Yeah. Yeah, this is the thing that uh, it's been really tough because it seems like it's just a shirt, right? It shouldn't be that hard to make. but. It, it could be an engine for all I know. Like it doesn't matter. Like you, I don't know how to make it, so I have to find an expert that does and, and just get the schematics of what it looks like. It's you know, terminology that I don't understand. I was lucky enough to work with uh, Allie Egan, who's a, a women's clothing designer in town. She's amazing. She's helped me out a lot, uh, and I help her with computer stuff. It's a great fix because she doesn't understand that. And I don't understand this. But I've got a chance to learn a lot, but it's, I've kind of been at the mercy. That's been so frustrating for me too. Because anything like technology-wise, if I run into trouble, I've like figured out. Like I don't know how to work in this language. All right, I'll I'll figure it out. But I haven't been able to figure out how to design a shirt. So I've been kind of it's it's partly what's taken so long is I've kind of been at the mercy of of someone that does. But we're finally like the the unisex pattern is done. The ladies pattern is almost done. We, to answer half of your questions in here, like the shirts are almost ready. So don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> No, but they are. They're really almost ready, probably in July. No. Uh, you mentioned earlier that it's not win or lose, but it's win or learn, which is evidence to me that there's like a spiritual or um, maturity or growth process that happened. Can you describe a situation in which that faith in that concept was tested? Really, it's just, a, so I try to look at everything this way and it really helps because there's no, um, there's no negative then. So if something happens bad, it's like, okay, that happened. I'll learn from it and move on. And sometimes it's almost a good thing. And so it can really change your mindset if you look at, um, look at it that way. There's no negative. It also removes the risk because you can go ahead and try something because the worst that's gonna happen, there's no losing. The worst that's gonna happen is you're gonna learn and learning is good. Um, I don't know if there's a particular thing that happened that did that. Um, sometimes it's it takes a little bit, you know, to, to, to be able to realize that when when something negative happens or when something doesn't go your way. 
But it's just a mindset that I think can really help um, in, in terms of trying to always look at the bright side of even like a negative thing um, and, and learn from it. Awesome. Well, that's, that's that. Um, I got you this, Dan. Uh, these are made by a DIG member, Dave Sheffield. What is this? A hockey puck, and then it's got a bottle opener built in the bottom. So, thought it was a very appropriate gift, and we can't do Sabres logos, you can't do them yet uh, for copyright reasons, but, so these two guys fighting, but, you're a very peaceful guy, but there's, a, there's an inner fight kind of to you, and it reminded me of you, so I wanted to give you this on, thank you for coming to Startup Grind. Um, Matthew Pelkey, Bridging Business Leaders, uh, Black Sport Distillery. He does a lot of awesome things. Promix was yesterday, so I can't promote that, but um, sure there's other things coming up. Liz Callahan with the partnership of BN360. She also puts on a lot of great events for young professionals, entrepreneurs in the area. Um, Jeff Downer gave a shout out. But what's New York? Angels. He has a lot of money that he likes to give away. So that's, that's good. Uh, Scott Bader, Foundry, 3D Printing. Great guy to know. Um, Jess Edwards, the curator of DIG. Uh, Drew, thank you for manning the door and helping everybody. Emily, you're on Step Out Buffalo, so if you ever are wondering where you should go to eat or drink or do anything, just run on Step Out Buffalo's Facebook. Uh, Greg, Redline Rentals, uh, sports cars, so if you're trying to get to that entrepreneur dream, he can help you out. Uh, or at least you can feel like a successful entrepreneur for an hour at a time. Um, <laughs> I could really go around the room and say something about everybody, but at Neil Micro Business, he does a great job with the videos, Naples City, and with that, I think we're still going to Ulrich's. Ulrich's just opened yesterday. They were gracious enough to uh, extend drink specials, so I'm excited. I'm gonna go check that out. Um, if you haven't, if you don't know Ulrich's, it was founded in 1868. I just found out it was a speakeasy, really cool history, and hope to see you all day. Cool. And next starter round is July 26, I believe. It's the last Wednesday in July. Uh, Mitchell Patterson, who is a VC, uh, Syracuse based, but that will be a great event as well. Thank you. Twitter. Oh, Twitter and Facebook, social media. That's it.